the Social Democratic Party to have addressed this issue. Fine, you want to invite an industry to set up. Why do you need to have a small car plant of, of the Tatas? Nano. Why can't you think in terms of a bus manufacturing? Why could they not have asked this core Ashok Leyland? If Tata was not willing, why didn't they invite Ashok Leyland to set up a plant there? There are many questions like this which remain unanswered. And in fact, the criticism has come from within also. I mean, if you read Prabhat Patnaik's remarkable piece where he talks about subs subservience to capitalism or subversion of capitalism, it's a remarkable critique of his own party and its policies and, and the way in which they have shifted away from many of their fundamental postulates. So there is something to be said about. And I think this frustration, the, the, the lack, I mean, people can talk about whether armed revolution will get you anywhere, we don't know. It's an open, as far as I'm concerned, the jury is still out. I'm not going to close it by saying that because they have failed after uh, X number of years or 30 years, nobody has succeeded, therefore they will... I mean, I don't believe in this kind of... Uh, uh, this is too speculative and we don't know it. And in fact, in Nepal, if they did not do it, there are a number of reasons uh, for which they chose a different path. It's not because it was just a question of stalemate. The point I'm trying to make is that the left front, which is with its past, with a kind of... I mean, in 66, they were able to push through land reform in West Bengal thanks to the Naxalbari movement because a section of its own party had revolted against the party leadership. It, faced, it, it posed a challenge to the party. If they had not done anything, they would have f f f completely been wiped out. The point I'm trying to make is that yes, left parties have a lot to contribute. And I for one would not like to dismiss them or to ridicule them or to denigrate them. No, they have much and I believe that they, they, but they must also look inside and where they have gone wrong. Why is it that they've, they've not been able to excite? I mean, anybody outside the three states, why is it that in Bihar, they are not a strong force? Why is it that in Uttar Pradesh, they are not a big force? Why is it in Orissa, they are not a big force? In adjoining states of West Bengal, if they had been successful in their experiment, if they had shown that it was still possible to work within the constitutional scheme of things and still be able to do something and, and enable people to prosper and, and to, to, to empower people, you know, really, then a lot many more people have joined the ranks and they would have been, I mean, people would have looked at, the, you know, looked at the, the left front as an alternative. Unfortunately, they haven't, they haven't created that alternative. So when we talk about peaceful path, I wonder, I mean, which peaceful path are you talking about in this country? Even the ML groups which left and joined the parliament, I mean, parliament and stand for elections, what is their fate? They're nowhere close to what Maoists are. So there is something, in fact, if you go by empirical evidence, I would say the Maoists have shown that you can expand. Maoists have shown that you can consolidate and you can fight the state. Maoists have shown that you don't have to compromise on your, on your fundamental objective of wanting to transform the state and society. It does not mean that we have to agree 100% with them. It does not mean that we have no questions. It does not mean any of these things. But it gives us a space to raise these issues. Otherwise, this whole project to transform the state and society would have, been, would have finished in this country. I would like to know because we have been talking something and a powerful voice of dissent came out. But I feel that because people say that Arundhati and you also mentioned about because of this structural change, paradigm shift, it brought in its way structural violence, which is huge, which has a huge implication. But I feel that democracy is hope. Democracy really creates a short of hope for the people and what we have been um, fighting for. But now, because of this structural shift, that people started saying, Arundhati Rai, I think, previously said, I fully remember that there was a criminalization of our democratic space. And other people also say that attenuation of our democratic quality. So, what do you think that under this, because some people say that because this market force or this globalization, which is a very much a centralized structure, 
and we are talking about democracy, which is very much decentralized. It's decentralized. When we talk either recently, I feel that uh, <clears throat> this uh, year that Panchayati Raj Minister wrote an article in the Indian Express. He was advocating that how Panchayat Raj clause, six clause, which gives all rights to the tribals in decision making, that has been violated. And he was saying that planned and unplanned funds around 50 crores annually can be brought for that development, but it is not being taken care of. So what do you think about, in the, on the one side it is the centralized structure, which really dictates the terms, and on the other hand there is a, people say that there is a decentralized structure under Panchayati Raj institution, which is not functioning, and participation, inclusion, all this is the key for the success of development. I would li like to hear your comment, because development we needs, because without development we can't expect that democracy will sustain, although we don't have faith on democracy. It is a very much non-dysfunctional. So I would like your comment. I think this um, the 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 use of the word democracy to uh, wrap up the capitalist project is not new. Even if you read the debates at the time of the Spanish Civil War, you know that that was what democracy was understood to be a kind of uh, Trojan horse to smuggle in capitalism. So today, I think what you have to ask, the question you have to ask about democracy is that there was a time when democracy was a real threat to the forces of imperialism, you know? So for example, if you, f if you look very closely at how the Salvador Allende government in Chile was toppled, and what that government tried to do and how it was toppled. It's an amazing story of how workers tried their best to keep it going, you know? And America and the CIA and all the forces that it used to topple democracy. And there was a time when they were scared of democracy. The imperialist power, America was scared of democracy in Latin America, toppled democracy after democracy. And today, you have wars to put democracies in place. So they say we fought in Afghanistan to place democracy there, we fought in Iraq to put democracy there, because democracy is a shameless suction pump. You know? Every, everything has been hollowed out. So that's what we have. That's the kind of democracy we have. We should be ashamed to call it democracy, you know? Where, when I was traveling in Tamil Nadu, it's not just that the po political parties pay the media for good coverage. Now they also have to pay the media so that they don't get bad coverage. Then the good coverage is an extra fee. The, everything is, is just a, a, a transaction. I mean, you have a judge in the Supreme Court who says, uh, when he's listening to the Vedanta case, that uh, he, one of them said, tribals have no place in this case. And then the other said, uh, we, uh, this um, Sterlite is a very good company. I have shares in Sterlite. We won't give it to Vedanta, we'll give it to Sterlite. When Sterlite is a sister concern of Vedanta. Now, what, and he's the Chief Justice now, and he's known as a very honest man, you know? So, what are we talking about is people in power whose imaginations have been totally colonized. It's not about corruption alone. It's about a colonized imagination. And look how interesting it is that people who don't win elections, our prime minister has never won an election in his life. But he's there taking the decisions. The people who win elections stay out of power so that they can be the good guys. The people who don't win elections are the prime minister. And if he doesn't take the decision, the Supreme Court takes them. And then if you criticize them, you go to jail because it's contempt of court. So, so you see how, how the machine has been set up. And you just keep going round and round and round in that, like those, you know, those motorcyclists in those old circuses who used to go around like that in those big globes. You feel like that. You go and the higher speed you go, the safer you are. And you know, it's like I often say I feel like when I was in school, 
I once stole all the carrots from the garden of my Malayalam teacher and then planted the tops back. And for a long time he was watering those plants and wondering why is it not, you know. So every institution of ours has been, has been uprooted and plant, hollowed and planted.